haven't met before, my name's Alice. I am a CMT doctor. I work at Newham and I went to Bart's as well. And again, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for letting me come, Andy. Um, today, I'm going to talk about loss of consciousness. This was um, a topic that your predecessors asked us to talk about, and I can completely see why, because it's a really broad topic and it's quite confusing. There's so many different causes, um, and it can be quite confusing, but I've made it really, really fun. So we're going to have a really fun time, and I really hope that you like Disney. And if you don't, then I really, really apologize a lot because you'll see a lot why. Um, so, loss of consciousness is an important topic. It's very common. Um, we see lots of people in A&E or who come to GP surgeries saying that they've had a collapse and they've lost consciousness. And it's up to you to decide, was it a faint? Was it a fit? Was it a funny turn? You've got to try and work that out with your history. In your exams, this will probably come up. I got it for my history taking station. It was a, it was a seizure, but that was the scenario. Um, so it comes up in exams. It comes up in real life. And also, when you're working on the wards, you're going to get called to see patients that are fitting, and you need to know what to do, because you're going to be the doctor. So we're going to go through all of this. But as I say, it is complicated, and there's loads of things that can cause you to lose consciousness. So you could just faint because you're just so over-emotioned, you just love medicine, you love studying for finals so much that it's just, it just gets the best of you and you faint. Falls, maybe, you've, maybe it's a fall that they came in with, we don't know if they lost consciousness, did they lose consciousness and fall, or did they fall, bang their head and then lose consciousness? Epilepsy, triggers, flashing lights, jewels, very common in the East End. Um, poison. If you've taken too many drugs, you can lose consciousness. Heart. Lots of heart problems. You can faint. Hypothermia. Especially this time of year. Actually, last night on my night shift, we admitted a chap who jumped in the docks in East London. And he had a temperature of 35.7, which I didn't think was compatible with life, but... I mean, he didn't have any consciousness, but he, he was alive, and he's still alive. So hypothermia, um, trauma, falling off buildings to save your princess, or things like birth trauma, cerebral palsy, they can cause seizures. Um, and then weird sort of psychiatric narcolepsy, things like that. So it's complicated. There's so many different causes. Obviously, these are just the hand-picking, and we're going to try and get away so that you can approach it systematically, because I think that's the only way you can approach this topic. So we'll go through causes. We'll talk a bit about history, how you're going to determine, was it syncope, was it seizure, a bit about what you're going to examine, what investigations you order. Um, I've included everything you want to know about flying and driving, because it changes all the time. So I've got the local DVLA guidelines. We'll go through them. And then a tiny bit about law and medicine. And then a summary of all the fun that we've had. Um, so sticking to my Disney theme, I have divided loss of consciousness into three categories. And I think if you approach it this way, you won't, it safety nets you and you won't miss serious things. So the main things is heart. Is this a problem with someone's heart and they've blacked out, they've lost consciousness? You don't want to miss that. Two is neuro, is it a seizure? Um, and then three is this box of question marks, all the other things that are important to know about but may not be so serious. So we'll start with the heart. Um, so in a nutshell, very, very basic. If the structure of the heart's wrong, you can lose consciousness. If you have an arrhythmia, and then a bit about vasculature. So first of all, who, who's fainted? Who's ever fainted? What did it feel like? In, yeah. Up. Yeah, pretty much. And I've uh, come up with a nice acronym. It's not as good as my WART acronym in sepsis, but I've had a go. So basically, these are the four... There's lots of other things you can feel, but these are four main things that distinguish a syncopal episode. So 
so you're dizzy. Once you've fallen over, you sort of instantly recover after a few seconds. You might be quite sweaty. The supine thing is once you're on the floor, you can't faint anymore because the blood has gone to your brain. Um, and then again, you sometimes feel quite sick and things beforehand. Um, so that's just a little thing for syncope. So with the heart, thinking about the heart, so structural, number one, this is the big one I want you to remember, aortic stenosis. So 80% of you will probably get a case of aortic stenosis in your finals exams, and you're going to be so happy if you get it because you're all going to know what to listen for. And you really need to learn aortic stenosis inside out because you're probably going to get it, so you might as well. Um, so what are the symptoms of aortic stenosis? Syncope. Syncope. Excellent. There's two more. Chest pain. Chest pain Breathless. and breathlessness. So if they have these, one of these three or all three, that's bad. Their stenosis is so bad, they really need a valve replacement. And what's the murmur that you're going to hear? Ejection systolic. Heard in expiration, radiates to the carotids. Um, and then the three things of severity is the narrow pulse pressure, the slow rising pulse. So often you can't really feel the carotids, you know, when you're just sort of feeling and you really can't feel anything. Often it's because it's a slow rising pulse. It's difficult to feel. Um, narrow pulse pressure and you lose the second heart sound. The second heart sound can be very soft. And that's because the first heart sound is the mitral valve shutting. And the second heart sound is the aortic valve shutting. So if it's very stenosed, it's obviously just going to... And it's just so quiet, you can't hear it. So they're the signs of severity. Um, and then you're going to do a valve replacement. That's your management. Um, so know this one. The other one that's similar is hokum, so hyper, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, very rare. Um, but it comes up in exams, and essentially it's, it's a genetic disorder. It's to do with sarcomere, and um, you basically get dispro disproportionate hypertrophy of the septum, and then that can cause the outflow obstruction, so you get all the same sort of signs and symptoms as aortic stenosis. Um, and management, that's the one when you have to tell them not to do sport and they have to try and take it easy. And often they have a family history of sudden cardiac collapse. Um, and then they can try things like a myomectomy and ablation, but it's not always successful. But aortic stenosis is one to remember. So arrhythmias, essentially, if your heart goes too fast or your heart goes too slow, then blood might not get to your brain and you might lose consciousness. I'm not going to go through treatment of this, but at the end, for extra fun, I've put in all the ALS guidelines for how to treat tachycardia and bradycardia, which I don't think you need for finals, but if you're really keen and having so much fun, you can look at it afterwards. Um, and then the funny sort of arrhythmias like Brugada syndrome, Tossard de Point. Um, essentially, Brugada is a channelopathy, again, genetic. Um, the thing to look out for is they get... Um, ST elevation in leads V1 to 3 and then a T wave inversion um, and in torsades de point it's meant to look like a ballerina spinning around um, it's like a poly polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and again the point about these two is that if they suddenly occur then they can lead to asystole or ventricular fibrillation <coughs> or ventricular tachycardia they're going to have a cardiac arrest and you're going to have to shock them so that's why you need to just recognize those two on the ECG. Because if someone passes out and has that on their ECG, that's bad. Okie dokie. Vasculature. So um, if you've been vomiting, like in Andy's lecture, or you've had lots of diarrhea, you're obviously going to have low volume in your vasculature and therefore low perfusion, and you can pass out. Medications could also cause this diuretics. Um, antihypertensives anatomical so that's things like carotid sinus hyper, um, hypersensitivity often if people have really sensitive carotid sinuses if they're shaving or if they have a tight collar on and they look to cross the road then the pressure makes them pass out so that's again you'll get that from only taking a good history um, and subclavian steel syndrome. So this is when you have a blockage in your subclavian artery. 
or you have a cervical, um, an, an extra rib that goes around there. And then basically, normally it's if you're painting or like doing your hair and your arms in the air, the blood, it can't go through the subclavian artery. So it goes up the vertebral arteries around your circle of Willis and then it will come back down the vertebral artery to supply that subclavian because you're doing whatever you're doing with your arm in the air and therefore the blood's going to your arm, not to your head. It's steel, the arm steals the blood so you pass out. Um, again, you'll get that from the history only really. And autonomic. So um, we remember we've got our parasympathetic, our sympathetic nervous system in diseases like <coughs> Parkinson's and diabetes. Um, it can affect the, um, often the sympathetic nervous system, and that's control of vasoconstriction. So if you can't vasoconstrict when you stand up, all your blood's going to pool and then you drop your blood pressure. So that's like postural hypotension. So if someone said to you, can you do a lying standing blood pressure, would you know what to do? Nobody knows. You all know. So you, you do the blood pressure lying, you stand them up, you wait for three minutes, then you do the blood pressure again. So it's the lying standing, it's the difference between the two. And if the systolic is greater than 20, then that's positive. So if I lay down and I had a blood pressure of 120 over 80, and then I stood up and my systolic went to 100, then I would have a positive postural drop. And the diastolic, if that's a drop in 10. Um, and often um, it's important to know this because sometimes the nurses don't know how to do it, so you have to just tell them nicely. Um, right, so we've done vascular cardio, so it's not that hard, mainly aortic stenosis and arrhythmias. Um, we'll come on to epilepsy and seizures in a minute, but first, just quickly, this other, the box of random things that can occur. Um, so we, we mentioned vasovagal, so that's just um, basically often it's a reflex. You get bradycardia and you get peripheral vasodilatation in hot rooms or reaction to fear or excitement um, and having so much fun during this lecture and you just pass out. Um, some people get it after coughing and micturition. I don't really know why, but that can occur. Um, and we've probably a few of us have had it in the operating theatre. Um, hypoglycemia. So if, you're, if you've got low blood sugar, often you can become very drowsy and then you can lose consciousness. Um, so again, is everybody happy how to treat hypoglycemia if they got called by the nurses because someone's having a hypo? So you basically give them sugar. You go to the ward, every ward has an orange box on it, and in the orange box there's Kit Kats, and normally Umbongo, for some reason, in New York they have Umbongo, don't even know where they buy it from. Um, so give your patient one of them, um, or they've got the gel, just put the gel in their gums. If they can't swallow glucagon, they've got the injection, it's all made up, you just whack it in. And then once they come around, you get them to eat something, probably toast and jam, something that's like complex carb to get their sugar level up again and then obviously look at their chart are they on loads of insulin why have they had a hypo are they nil by mouth and nobody put them on any dextrose or something um, so that's hypo drop attack that's sort of an old term it can be used to describe lots of things um, it can be like cataplexy and things in epilepsy or it could just be a knees give way um, or maybe it's a stroke aphasia, can't talk, or diagnosis of exclusion, psychiatric, you've just got to bear that in mind. Um, other really important things quickly, a PE, a really big PE will cause you to lose consciousness. This is just my way of remembering the Wells score because I can never remember the Wells score, so I've made another acronym. Um, PIMS FD, don't know what FD means, but these are so pregnancy pill, risk factors for clot, immobility, malignancy, straightforward. Disorders of clotting is things like um, antiphospholipid syndrome and thrombophilia, things like that. That's just an extra tip. Cardiac arrest. Obviously, if someone's passed out from a cardiac arrest, they definitely don't have any consciousness. That's the point. 
Um, and these are your reversible causes, your H's and your T's. Again, you can look at them. You all know them, I know already. Um, right, so we've done other and we've done cardio. Now we'll come on to seizures. So a seizure is an abnormal event due to electrical discharge in the brain. And epilepsy is just the tendency to have seizures. So, um, yeah, pretty straightforward, really. And this is my other acronym to help us remember the seizure history versus the syncope history. Um, and often, so they do a we, they're incontinent. They might have an aura before that they've um, had the seizure. Often they smell something really, really bad, or sometimes they can see things. Um, limb jerking. So limb jerking in a true seizure is symmetrical on both sides. You can't fit like this. It has to be both sides going at the same time. Um, and they have a long recovery. They very confused, very drowsy for hours afterwards sometimes. And obviously, they can bite their tongue. Um, when people are faking it, sometimes they bite their tongue, but they tend to bite the tip of their tongue, whereas if it's a true bite, it's the side, because it's really painful to bite the side of your tongue. It's painful to bite the tip, but it's really painful to bite the side. Um, so you've got to think of triggers. Why have they had a seizure? Um, were they exposed to flashing lights? Were they tired? Sometimes caffeine, chocolate can do it. Infection, have they had a recent like ENT infection or have they got neck, stickness, uh, neck stiffness, photophobia? Have they got meningitis and now they're having a seizure? That's really bad. Alcohol withdrawal and illicit drugs. Um, Alcohol withdrawal, a very common thing that we see, especially in um, East London and you, and we've got lots of Eastern Europeans, they come in, they've had a fit, we don't really know what's happened, and they wake up and they just say, vodka, big bottle, and you're like, yes, that's why you fitted, okay. So we're going to put them on some alcohol withdrawal medications, which are chlordazepoxide, which is basically a benzo, so that chills them out, it's like giving them a gin and tonic to sort of lower their seizure threshold so that they won't have a fit and then you give them Pabronex that's the other thing and I never used to really understand what Pabronex was but essentially it's just basically vitamin B1 so it's thiamine it's got some other vitamins in it but it's basically thiamine the reason we give Pabronex number one we don't want them to get Wernicke's or Korsakoff's so Wernicke's is um, when you've had thiamine deficiency, you get very confused, you get nystagmus, they sometimes get a fever, but it's reversible. We can reverse it if we give them thiamine. If we don't reverse it, they then go on to have Korsakoff's, which is when they make up things, confa confabulation. They can't make any short-term memories, and it's really debilitating. It's like having dementia, so that's why we want to avoid it. The other thing with thiamine is if you have thiamine deficiency, you can get wet and dry beriberi. So dry beriberi is when the thiamine affects your nerves and you get peripheral neuropathy. And wet beriberi is when it affects your heart and you get edema, essentially. So that's why we give everyone thiamine. Um, the other thing with drugs is you've got to think, what drugs has this patient been on recently? And that's when you think about all your P450 enzyme inhibitors and inducers. I've put slides at the end in my fun section to remind you what the P450 enzyme inducers and inhibitors are. But essentially, things like, for example, macrolide antibiotics, so erythromycin, that will, I think it's an inhibitor, will stop you from breaking down your um, metabolizing other drugs so it can build up in your system. So that's why we worry about that. And that's why we do warfarin and INR control on everyone that comes into hospital. So I always used to think, well, they go home and they don't come to warfarin clinic for like two weeks, so why are we monitoring that INR like every single day? But it's because when they come into hospital, they often go into, on other drugs, which then affect their liver enzymes, and then they don't metabolize the warfarin. It goes too high, it goes too low, and that's why we get so obsessed with warfarin. Um, did they have a headache? Is this a space-occupying lesion? So like pain on bending forward first thing in the morning, or is it a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Um, trauma, again, head trauma, or birth trauma, is it cerebral palsy? Um, and non-compliance, so maybe they're epileptic and they just, they were late to take their medicine. 
so they had a seizure. You all know about the different types of seizure, so we've got focal and generalised, and generalised is basically your tonic-chronic um, absent seizures, and then focal is more you don't always lose consciousness. It's just a table for it. Um, so the history, the main point I want to nag about the history, because it's so important, is it's this before, during, and after the event. So the, this is the focus of your history. Like in chest pain history, when you're going to do Socrates, in a seizure syncopal history, this is you're going to do what happened before, how did you feel, did you feel dizzy, did you have an aura, um, did you feel sick? What happened during? Often they can't tell you, so you really need a collateral history. <coughs> So this is when you've got to speak to a friend who's seen it. Um, and then, obviously, after, how long did it take them to recover? And it's important that you get the history right, because the history is often really crucial for diagnosis. And diagnosing someone with epilepsy when they don't have it has such massive implications on their life. So you've really got to be careful. Um, this is a quick table, which basically is a bit like a well score, but for seizure syncope. So you get a point or you get minus points if you have any of these, which is basically the Walt Disney acronym, in other words. And then if you get a score of one, then you've had a seizure. It's, you can look at it in your own time if you find it helpful. Um, right, so you're on the ward, and um, the nurse has called you because... Um, Mr. Mouse has had a seizure. So what are you going to do? A, B, C, D, e. Yay! You're going to do A, B, C, D, E. So A, B, C, do not ever forget glucose or disability, exposed family glucose. Um, so you've done your A, B, C, or again, you could do your chemo IV. So you take control, take a quick history, or ask the nurses what's been going on quickly examine the patient, put some monitoring on, get some oxygen on them, and get IV access. And I know it's difficult if they're seizing to get IV access, but you've really got to try, because that's how you're going to treat the seizure most effectively. So once we have our IV access, we're going to give them IV lorazepam. And often in hospital, they've already got IV access, so it's not too, it's not too hard. Um, so you give four milligrams. And if they're still seizing, you can repeat it after five minutes. If you can't get IV access, then you can do rectal or buccal um, diazepam or midazolam. It's just they don't work as quickly and they don't work for as long. And obviously it's not very nice to have something shoved up your bottom if you don't have to. And then if they have status... Um, then that basically means if they've been fitting for 30 minutes, or maybe they fitted for a bit and then they stopped for a bit, but then they fitted again and it's sort of been going on for about 30 minutes, so they've never fully recovered that status. You need to get help. You shouldn't be managing that on your own. Um, get some help and they'll be started on all this phenytoin infusions and sometimes propofol as well, but you won't have to manage that. So... Um, if they've come to A&E, they had a seizure, they feel better now, you're going to examine them. So essentially, top to toe again. This is just to remember, look in their mouth if they've bitten their tongue. Look all over them, have they injured themselves when they fell over? If they were seizing, did they hit something? Have they got any injuries? And then you're going to do your heart exam to listen for your ejection systolic murmur radiating to the carotids and expiration with a slow rising pulse. See if they've got aortic stenosis, as well as your... PNS, like peripheral nerves. Um, investigations, bloods. So you're going to do all your routine bloods. This is just to mention, if you've had a seizure, your CK will go up because the muscles are damaged. So that's a really good marker if you want to know whether someone's actually had a seizure. Prolactin was the other one that people mentioned, but actually we don't really do that because it's only raised half an hour after the seizure and then it can dip and it can be raised in other situations so basically don't do a prolactin and then toxicology if you think that they have taken something that they shouldn't have um, so in the reds we've got so if you think it's a cardiac cause you're going to do <coughs> blood pressures ECG chest x-ray and an echo and if you're thinking more neuro cause then you're going to do CT head MRI head 
Again, you might have a space-occupying lesion. That's why they had a fit, or um, they might have had a bleed. Um, and then an EEG. And when you do your ECG, remember to shave their chest, because if they've got really hairy chest, then you don't get a good signal, so it's important. Um, okay, if it's their first seizure, they've never had one before, um, you do your bloods, you do your investigations, and you don't necessarily start them on any medicine if they're fine. You can let them go home. If it's their second seizure, though, then you need to start them on something. And if it's generalised, it tends to be sodium valproate. If it's partial, it tends to be carbamazepine. And then lamotrigine is a third, is a second line to both of them. And then you've got things like phenytoin. Have you guys seen this picture before? So, this picture is all the side effects of phenytoin, which comes up in exams. And once you've seen that, I don't think you'll ever forget it because it's horrible. So they get jaundiced, they get nystagmus, they get hirsutism, um, gingival hyperplasia, it's teratogenic, it's folate, it interferes with folate metabolism and it affects bones like osteomalacia. So there are your side effects of phenytoin, which I literally can't get this image out of my head, it's horrible. Um, I don't know. I didn't draw it. Um, and that's what, um, this is a gingival hyperplasia in real life, a bad one. Um, Counselling. So this will be important in your OSCE. This is what we had to do. So you have to tell them to avoid precipitants. So obviously tell them not to look at flashing lights, not to get tired, not to eat chocolate, not to drink coffee, all the fun things they're not allowed to do. Um, Ask about their, what they like to do in their spare time. Like if they're a, they love rock climbing and they've got epilepsy, it might be worth not doing rock climbing anymore in case they had a seizure. And things like swimming, they shouldn't go swimming by themselves. If they have a bath, they should leave the door unlocked just in case um, they had a fit because you really don't want them to drown. Um, pregnancy. So they can get pregnant, um, and you just have to warn them that if they had a fit during pregnancy, the harm to the baby would be much more than if they took the anti-epileptic drugs during pregnancy. So that's the message you're getting across. Obviously, they'll go under a specialist. They should try and plan their pregnancy. They need to take folic acid and all that stuff. Um, but they can, they can get pregnant. Um, and then driving, right. So... Flying and driving, I've written it all down. Flying, let's start with flying. So, first of all, cardiac. If you have heart failure or uncontrolled high blood pressure, you're not allowed to fly. Um, respiratory, if you've had a pneumothorax, you can fly if you've had it drained and all the air was absorbed and it's two weeks after that, then you can fly. So say you went hot on holiday and then you had a pneumothorax, you'd probably have to wait about three weeks to come home again. Um, Haematology, seeing as that was the topic of today. If your HB is under eight, apparently you're not allowed to fly. Don't think they check it, but that's what you should tell your patients. Um, and then if you're pregnant, if you're over 36 weeks pregnant, you shouldn't fly. And if you've got multips or twins, then 32 weeks. Um, Driving, first of all, interesting point that I'd sort of forgotten about. If you're over 70, then you have to have your license renewed every three years. Um, and if you drive an HGV, jan, HGV van, then um, if you're over 45, that's the upper age, you've got to have your license renewed every, every year. Um, right, all the other things. So... If it's your first seizure, you just had a seizure, they don't know why you had it, and there's nothing that they could find that provoked the seizure, you can't drive for six months. If you have epilepsy, though, you've been diagnosed, you have epilepsy and you're on medication, you have to be seizure-free for three years before you can drive again. 
and if you're driving an HGV dra I I can't say it, an H heavy goods vehicle, then it's 10 years. Um, if you had a Vesa Vagal, you can drive. You don't have to tell the DVLA, that's fine. Um, if you had a TIA, then it's one month off driving. Um, and if you had a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass graft, then you have, to wait, you have to wait four weeks before you can drive again. In terms of diabetes and insulin, if you're on insulin, you can drive a car as long as you are aware of your hypos and that your vision is okay, because obviously diabetic retinopathy. Um, but you cannot drive a heavy goods vehicle if you are insulin diabetic. And then my other interesting fact, which I'll slot in here, if you've had a myocardial infarction, you're not allowed to have sex for two weeks afterwards, just in case. Um, quickly, a little bit about law and medicine. So consent, you all know what consent is, but again, this comes up time and time again. So you need to be able to understand, retain, weigh up, a, weigh up the material and communicate it back. Um, obviously, if you've lost consciousness, then you have implied consent, and in an emergency, you can do what you need to do to get that person better. Um, right, the law. So there's this thing called the defense of automatism, and basically, there are a few cases when there was a lady and she threw her baby out the window because she thought the house was on fire during a night terror. And there was another case where there was a man and he strangled his wife to death because he was sleepwalking and he thought there was an intruder. So both of them were cleared and they were not guilty because they weren't conscious of what they were doing because they, they were asleep. So sleepwalking. However, if you were asleep at the wheel of a car because you fell asleep because you were tired driving, that doesn't count. You're guilty because you have a warning that you're going to fall asleep. So that's just a little point on that. So, we talked about the heart, cardiac causes of syncope, so <coughs> structural aortic stenosis, arrhythmias, tachybrady, vascular problems. <coughs> we talked about neuro, seizures, partial, generalized, and secondary, so space occupying lesions, strokes. <coughs> and then we spoke about the other things, so vasovagal, hypoglycemia, stroke, psychiatric. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, that's our overview. Any questions? Yes. And if someone comes in and they've already been sitting for half an hour before you see them, can you still start, do you start the Razapan? Yeah, I'll start with the Razapan, but you're going to be on the phone to ITU being like, you need to come now. Um, often, though, if they've come in like with the, AL, um, with the ambulance, they're really good at doing all this as well. And if they are epileptic, they often have their own, they've got like bracelets, they've got their own medication. So sometimes they've been given it. But if they've still been given that and they're still fitting, you're just going to go straight to try and probably, you basically want to sedate them, get them on propofol, stop them from fitting. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I forgot to say, so if you go to the woods, say they're starting to have a fit, first of all, don't try and put wooden spoons in their mouths or do any of that stuff. Leave them be, make sure they're safe. So obviously, if they're whacking their arm on something hard, take that hard thing away if you can. Just be with them, mainly get oxygen on them. They're not really going to breathe it in because they don't breathe when they're having a seizure, but as soon as they do start breathing, they're really hypoxic. I normally talk to them, I'm just like, you know, you're in hospital, it's okay, like just in case they can hear, and then you look nice, caring to the other patients in the bay who are really scared. Um, but they do often stop after a minute or so, um, but it's always good to be prepared. So be, you be with the patient, and then again, it's about teamwork, so working with your nurses, like, can you get some oxygen, can you quickly go and get the drugs trolley, we might need some lorazepam, all that stuff. So you're just planning ahead. But often, yeah, they just fit, and you just let you let the fit, you just let them fit, and then um, obviously oxygen uh, when they come around, reassure them, and then 
you're going to be investigating them. But yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Cool. So um, there's a really fun, extra fun YouTube video for you guys to watch later. And for the for the keen beans, here's some algorithms on tachycardia, bradycardia. These are the P450 inducers and a way to remember it, and um, the inhibitors. And that's the end.